the ego in post-Freudian theory in Chapter 2, we pointed out that Freud used the analogy of a rider on horseback to describe the relationship between the ego and the id. The rider, ego, is ultimately at the mercy of the stronger horse, id. The ego has no strength of its own but must borrow its energy from the id. Moreover, the ego is constantly attempting to balance blind demands of the superego against the relentless forces of the id and the realistic opportunities of the external world. Freud believed that, for psychologically healthy people, the ego is sufficiently developed to reign in the ID, even though its control is still tenuous and ID impulses might erupt and overwhelm the ego at any time. In contrast, Erickson held that our ego is a positive force that creates a self-identity, a sense of I. As the center of our personality, our ego helps us adapt to the various conflicts and crises of life and keeps us from losing our individuality to the leveling forces of society. During childhood, the ego is weak, pliable, and fragile, but by adolescence it should begin to take form and gain strength. Throughout our life, it unifies personality and guards against indivisibility. Erickson saw the ego as a partially unconscious organizing agency that synthesizes our present experiences with past self-identities and also with anticipated images of self. He defined the ego as a person's ability to unify experiences and actions in an adaptive manner, Erickson, 1963. Erickson, 1968, identified three interrelated aspects of ego, the body ego, the ego ideal, an ego identity. The body ego refers to experiences with our body, a way of seeing our physical self as different for other people. We may be satisfied or dissatisfied with the way our body looks and functions, but we recognize that it is the only body we will ever have. The ego ideal represents the image we have of ourselves in comparison with an established ideal, it is responsible for our being satisfied or dissatisfied not only with our physical self but with our entire personal identity. Ego identity is the image we have of ourselves in the variety of social roles we play. Although adolescence is ordinarily the time when these three components are changing most rapidly, alterations in body ego, ego ideal, and ego identity can and do take place at any stage of life. Society's influence Although inborn capacities are important in personality development, the ego emerges from and is largely shaped by society. Erickson's emphasis on social and historical factors was in contrast with Freud's mostly biological viewpoint. To Erickson, the ego exists as potential at birth, but it must emerge from within a cultural environment. Different societies, with their variations in child-rearing practices, tend to shape personalities that fit the needs and values of their culture. For example, Erickson found that prolonged and permissive nursing of infants of the Sioux Nation, sometimes for as long as four or five years, resulted in what Freud would call oral personalities, that is, people who gain great pleasure through functions of the mouth. The Sioux place great value on generosity, and Erickson believed that the reassurance resulting from unlimited breastfeeding lays the foundation for the virtue of generosity. However, Sioux parents quickly suppress biting, a practice that may contribute to the child's fortitude and ferocity. On the other hand, people of the Yurok nation set strict regulations concerning elimination of urine and feces, practices that tend to develop annually, or compulsive neatness, stubbornness, and miserliness. In European American societies, orality and anally are often considered undesirable traits or neurotic symptoms. Erickson, however, argued that orality among the Sioux hunters and anally among the Yurok fishermen are adaptive characteristics that help both the individual and the culture. The fact that European American culture views orality and anally as deviant traits merely displays its own ethnocentric view of other societies. Erickson argued that historically all tribes or nations, including the United States, have developed what he called a pseudo-species, that is, an illusion perpetrated and perpetuated by a particular society that it is somehow chosen to be the human species. In past centuries, this belief has aided the survival of the tribe, but with modern means of world annihilation, such a prejudiced perception, as demonstrated by Nazi Germany, threatens the survival of every nation. 
One of Erickson's principal contributions to personality theory was his extension of the Freudian early stages of development to include school age, youth, adulthood, and old age. Before looking more closely at Erickson's theory of ego development, we discuss his view of how personality develops from one stage to the next. Epigenetic Principle Erickson believed that the ego develops throughout the various stages of life according to an epigenetic principle, a term borrowed from embryology. Epigenetic development implies a step-by-step -step growth of fetal organs. The embryo does not begin as a completely formed little person, waiting to merely expand its structure and children crawl before they walk, walk before they run, and run before they jump. Form Rather, it develops, or should develop, according to a predetermined rate and in a fixed sequence. If the eyes, liver, or other organs do not develop during that critical period for their development, then they will never attain proper maturity. In similar fashion, the ego follows the path of epigenetic development, with each stage developing at its proper time. One stage emerges from and is built upon a previous stage, but it does not replace that earlier stage. This epigenetic development is analogous to the physical development of children, who crawl before they walk, walk before they run, and run before they jump. When children are still crawling, they are developing the potential to walk, run, and jump, and after they are mature enough to jump, they still retain their ability to run, walk, and crawl. Erickson described the epigenetic principle by saying that anything that grows has a ground plan, and that out of this ground plan the parts arise, each part having its time of special ascendancy, until all parts have arisen to form a functioning whole. More succinctly, epigenesis means that one characteristic develops on top of another in space and time.